I was born in Africa. My Italian father had been exiled from his country by Mussolini for insubordination to the fascist party in 1926. My mother was French. She was an artist and lived on her own in a studio in Paris. She had studied with the great French sculptor Auguste Rodin, then already an old man. Her early visits to Morocco, where she drew and sculpted the people in the streets, awoke in her a fascination with the African continent. They were both real adventurers at heart, and in 1928 they went to Africa together, on a one-year foot safari through the Belgian Congo, followed by 60 black porters carrying their equipment on their heads. Africa then was pristine and still uncontaminated by our Western civilization. The pygmies of the Ituri forest in the Congo came out to gape at these white strangers in their midst. When she was seven months pregnant, my mother shot an elephant for them which they cut up and devoured. On their journey, they met King Muzinga of Rwanda. He introduced them to his family when he invited them to stay in the royal compound. My mother was fascinated by their elegance and decorative style of dress and made this drawing of his eldest son, Katabi. In 1930, they walked into Kenya, and I was born on July the 14th, 1931. They built a vast Italian castle at the bottom of the Rift Valley, where I grew up with my brother and my sister in a kind of sophisticated wilderness. We were looked after by a bevy of smiling Africans and played with animals instead of toys. We learned to shoot guns at an early age and hunted wild pig on foot with our dogs and our Maasai warriors. Despite our unusual African upbringing, my mother always retained her Parisian style and sometimes dressed us up like nice little European girls. The unusual and privileged environment of the colonies in which I grew up was never questioned until I was 25 when I met Lorenzo, a wild Italian adventurer who'd come to Kenya to make a film. He hired me as photographer on the set, and three months later, we got married. I became part of his adventurous life. Together, we sailed the Indian Ocean with his friends on his Arabian Dao which he named after me. I need a woman like you around, he said, when I took him on his first safari. At 36, I set out to make a photographic record of the vanishing tribal life of East Africa. This was to be the beginning of a 30-year journey as a photographer of Africa. I felt like a painter in front of an empty canvas. And as I ventured forward capturing these timeless images, I stepped into a world where the essence of Africa was still intact. But for how long?
On Lake Turkana in northern Kenya, I photographed the local fishermen whose survival depends on the abundant Nile perch in this legendary volcanic lake. With their ingenious fishing baskets, they provided powerful graphic images for my camera. Ever since I can remember, the beauty of the African people had been pointed out to me by my mother. She looked at them with the eyes of an artist and singled out to me the sculptural elements of their natural poise. Their elegance and grace have an almost feline quality as they stride across the landscape, draped in soft folds of cloth. They were still innocent and naive of the implications of being photographed and seemed unaware of what I was doing. They looked straight into my camera with the uninhibited curiosity of children. I did not yet know how threatened their lifestyle was and how timely was my presence among them. Now, 30 years later, having virtually abandoned their traditions, these same people have changed beyond all recognition. I discovered then that I had inherited my mother's eye. And at the time, I had no idea of the impact the photographs I was taking would have on my life, or that they would one day become an important record of a fast vanishing world. The people I photographed when I sailed with my crew to the Bajoon Islands in the Indian Ocean in search of the shy black veiled women of the East African coast have to my delight remained to this day virtually unchanged, as have their strict Muslim traditions. I later drew inspiration from these images for my European fashion shoots. And they went on to influence John Galliano's first Dior collection. When I photographed my glamorous friends and assistants, I quite instinctively searched for the same sculptural elements I had found in the Africans. Mm. 
The African women I met on my journeys taught me the value of the tactile reassurance they give to their children, who, for the first nine months of their lives, are in continual contact with their mother's body. It revealed to me how far removed we in the Western world are from this very natural custom. I captured magic moments in my own young family, who, like I had done, were living in wilderness freedom. White children born in Africa have no inhibitions. They faced my camera with the same innocent intensity of the Africans. They became the most photographed children in the world. With my camera always cocked and ready, I recorded the joy of their growing up and the sadness in my parents growing old. As an enemy alien in a British colony, my father was incarcerated for five years in a South African concentration camp and never really recovered from the experience. When the war was over, he wanted to return to Italy, but my mother persuaded him to stay in Africa. His consequent inner turmoil was now so evident in his eyes. The twinkle and the laughter in early photographs of him had gone. He was a broken man who had never bared his soul to me. The 50 years they shared together in Africa had somehow made one of them, and old age had finally erased the differences between them. To my shame, I have to admit that I was more interested in photographing my children than looking after them, which, however, made for some singular images. I lost my daughter Marina to cancer. She was 36 years old. Now all I have left of her are the fleeting moments I recorded with my camera while she was growing up. This tragedy in my life underlined the importance of what I am now doing, capturing the moments you never want to forget before they are gone forever. But life had to go on, and like so many times before, my camera came to my rescue. So I went on safari with Peter Beard. Like me, Peter loved to work in Africa, and I went with him on his wildlife fashion shoots, 
where I recorded his daring exploits photographing elephants, which he approached on foot to get his extraordinary pictures. When one day he pushed his luck too far, he was trampled to within an inch of his life. While he was being rushed to hospital, semi-comatose, he kept on asking if we had got it down on film. On one of his trips we photographed Iman, whom I had discovered ten years earlier. The moment I set eyes on her, I recognized her incredible beauty and took the very first photographs of her. She went on to become the most famous black model in the world. One day, as Peter and I were photographing Iman with one of the lions from out of Africa, the animal jumped on its trainer and pinned him to the ground. Iman kept her professional composure. Peter introduced me to his friend Phil Snyder, a wild-looking American from Idaho, who came to Africa in search of adventure and lived for 10 years on Mount Kenya, where he was the park warden. He was known as Mountain Madness. He took me on an unforgettable walk about up the slopes which were covered in giant exotic vegetation. I had never been on a mountain before and felt a bit at odds with it. I took his hand and followed silently as he led me into a fantastical world far removed from anything I'd ever experienced. A world where the air was so thin it made my heart beat faster and my lungs ache with every step I took. I followed the man with the black umbrella 30,000 steps up and 10,000 steps down. At times the fog was so thick he would disappear from sight and then reappear waiting for me to catch up. I fell in love with him immediately like so many girls before me had done. It was on these image hunts that I discovered I had a hunter's instinct. The mere knowledge that something somewhere existed was sufficient to set me off. So when I first saw this image in the loo of one of my friends, I was determined to follow it to its origin. From my friend's loo to the Okavango swamp, it led me to Randall Moor who had turned his dream of returning African elephants to their country of origin into reality in his half million acre concession in Botswana. Drawing on his experience training elephants for circuses and films, Randall knew that he could also train them to take people on their backs. There is no better way to move through the bush or approach game, he said. Elephants are silent and produce no petrol fumes. The sensation of heaving myself onto the five-ton, ten-foot-high abu was unforgettable. From his back, I looked out over the open swamp. Around us, Africa spread, shimmering in the early morning light. I was doing a travel article for a London magazine and took Natasha, an aspiring huntress, as my model. One day I persuaded her to strip down to her knickers for a mud bath with Abu. After much hesitation, to her credit, she complied to my request and I had a field day with my camera. Before leaving Abu camp, Randall organized his elephants for my lens and I felt like Fellini as they advanced towards me in the evening light. 
My next adventure was with Lorenzo on his African rainbow expedition that crossed the continent from east to west on the rivers and lakes of the equator. It was the jewel of my African odyssey and lasted for 18 months. Nothing before or since has rivaled it. Together we saw Africa as few people have done. It was a continuous and unforgettable visual feast that took us back to Conrad's heart of darkness and filled us with indelible memories that will stay with us into old age. How can people live in a place like this, in this dim, watery wilderness of matted leaves, roots and branches, buzzing with mosquitoes and hung with cobwebs? Are they immune to disease? And what do they do when they fall ill? Do they too get malaria and die the way we do? Drifting towards the sun, setting behind the dark trees, the idea of some demon using it as a target crossed our minds. Imagining ourselves as the first men taking possession of an accursed inheritance, we came across the wreck of a half-submerged river vessel, lying in the mud like a decaying carcass of some ancient dinosaur being absorbed back into Africa. In raised bronze letters on the front, it bore the name of the man who 60 years earlier had invited my family to Africa. Birds had nestled beneath the roof and in the still water below, an eerie creaking conveyed an uncanny sensation of life. The wake from our boats disturbed some giant catfish inside. All around us, it was very still beneath the great forest curtain. The powerful rowers in their wooden canoes that I photographed on our descent brought to mind the pages of Stanley's diaries that had so inspired Lorenzo on this journey. We could hear the billowing brown water of the Zongo Falls long before we saw it hurtling to the valley floor. It leapt hundreds of feet above us, filling the air with an endless cloud of spray that fell like a gossamer veil over the dark trees growing up the valley side and made us aware of the two million cubic feet per second that rush towards the Atlantic all year round. At the end of a journey such as this, which had been our life for so long, a feeling of melancholy began to creep in, giving rise to an unbearable apprehension of returning to mundane life, where the unexpected does not exist. As we pulled up into the Atlantic Ocean, Lorenzo was hurled overboard by his crew, as is the custom on such occasions. I didn't know then that this would be the last time I was able to savor the magic of Africa. Everything would change for me while on a picture story for the Sunday Times in Eritrea, where I encountered for the first time the tragedy of war. Nothing could have prepared me for the horror of the napalm-burned victims I met among the scattered mountain nomads, fleeing for their lives, shocked and terrified by the inhuman invasion that destroyed their peaceful lifestyle. The Eritreans nevertheless remained strong and defiant. The women joined the fighting ranks and after 40 years threw off their Ethiopian oppressors. It was known as the longest war in Africa. Our so-called civilization seems to have left a plague of war and famine in its wake that is crippling the continent and destroying the tribal lifestyles of people like the gentle nomadic Dinka, who have lived and survived for generations in the harsh Sudanese environment and are today being ravaged by this same plague. When I went to photograph their plight, the suffering Dinka swarmed around our aircraft like so many ants. It was truly shocking for me to see 
how this noble tribe had been reduced to penury and dependence on the white man. Nothing prepares you for mass starvation. Nothing protects you from the truth. It's not staring at the face of starvation that thuds like a blow to your heart. It is having starvation stare back at you. To try and combat this human tragedy, the World Food Programme is providing for the dying Dinka to the tune of one million dollars a day. Several times a day for over a year now, great Hercules aircraft take off at dawn and disgorge hundreds of tons of food over the stricken areas. It seems to me that aid on whatever level and in whatever form is like spitting into the wind, for the enigma of Africa is beyond the reach of man. Here in southern Sudan, I discovered that God and the devil are indeed one. For many years I have witnessed the slow disintegration of the continent unfold before my lens, and have learned that what is happening to Africa is part of her inevitable evolution. That however grim, it is also the consequence of destructive political and religious influences from the outside world. There are those for whom Africa works and those who become victims of Africa. Those for whom it works seem unfazed by her agony. The lifestyle Africa offers them more than compensates for the boring inconveniences they have to deal with on a daily basis, and they choose to ignore her suffering. Their individual stories bear witness to their originality, their offbeat characteristics, and the spirit of adventure and daring with which they have woven themselves into the fabric of the continent. They created a legendary world still being written about today, and are known as the Stayers On. It is this combination of beauty and rawness that lures the last romantics. And to outsiders, it seems like the only place left on earth where you can still play like children, pretending to be adults. However, unable to stand by, helpless and confounded by circumstances. I have opted out, preferring to distance myself rather than heighten my anguish so that I can retain the memory that gave birth to my love affair. Africa no longer sings to me. My life as a photographer of Africa has been an extraordinary adventure. African Visions is my testament to that life and to the changing fortunes of an often troubled continent, an Africa that today is vanishing. <laughs>